first case this morning, the debate of Edward Freiber. Each party will have 15 minutes to present their arguments. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for a bottle. And how long would you like to reserve for a bottle? I'd reserve five minutes. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the time up there, when you look at it, when you get on that top clock at five minutes, that's when your time is done. So I'm not going to reduce it to 10 minutes until we show 15, just so you know. Don't get confused if you have to look up there. The arguments are being recorded today. So please, when you come to the podium, first, make sure to introduce yourself. Secondly, you stay behind the podium, because if we're recording, if you move, we'll lose you. And also, please uh, speak loud enough so the recording can pick you up. If we can hear you up here, you'll just be just fine as far as that goes. When you're speaking, in this case, I don't think it really matters, but I don't refer to children, minors, victims by their name, just to refer to initials or some other term that we can understand who they are. Again, I don't think it's wrong in this particular case. So the judges have read your briefs and are ready to proceed whenever you want. My name is Hannah Lori Gambrell. I represent Jorge Vega, the appellate and plaintiff in the lower court. I'm here today to give a voice to my client, Mr. Vega. Throughout this process, uh, my client has indicated that he felt like his voice has been stripped away due to the circumstances surrounding these, this case. Mr. Vega filed his original complaint on January 12, 2021, alleging breach of contract, consumer sales act violations, unjust enrichment, and other claims. These claims are based on a dispute between Mr. Vega and Mr. Freeberg and his company over construction of a deck on a residential property. The parties attempted mediation several times throughout the two-year history of this case, um, and those, all those attempts were unsuccessful. The parties then attended a pretrial, final pretrial, April 13th of 2023 last year. During that pretrial, the parties engaged in final, final settlement negotiations for about three to four hours. And I'm giving my client's recollection of this because I wasn't retained until after this happened. At no point during these, no, during the, these negotiations were all parties ever together in the same room. Appellee's counsel asserts that there, the reason was because Mr. Vega, Mr. Vega indicated he didn't want that. Um, however, I don't even believe that the parties and their counsel were ever together talking to the magistrate during this process, from what Mr. Vega recalls. From what I understood took place, the parties were in separate areas. Um, the counsel for both parties were in separate rooms and they were periodically convened in the hallway with the magistrate to discuss how negotiation was going. Um, there, was, there were several numbers that were proposed throughout these negotiations. Um, and per my client's recollection, again, the last offer that was made by appellees was $10,000 over two years. Mr. Vega declined that offer affirmatively and countered with $15,000 at which point the appellees declined and then the parties were instructed to proceed with preparing for trial. There was never any final convening of the parties to discuss next steps. The parties were just instructed to proceed to, uh, to prepare for trial. Subsequently, all parties did that. They began to prepare for trial. Trial briefs were filed, proposed jury instructions were filed, subpoenas for witnesses, etc. No further discussion of settlement between my client and his former counsel took place between pretrial and April 24th when my client was informed that a settlement had been reached. My, my client was completely blindsided by his formal counsel, which I will not name during these proceedings. Um, his name is indicated in the brief. Um, and, and he was uh, told that an offer for $10,000 had been reached, which he never gave him authority to do. There are emails exchanged between Mr. Vega and his formal counsel um, discussing that objection or that Mr. Vega did not agree to any settlement agreement during pretrial. Apparently, Mr. Vega's former counsel is alleged to have acknowledged that settlement, well, he did acknowledge that settlement on the record, um, that a settlement had been agreed between the parties. However, appellant's former counsel had no authority to negotiate, which we understand is a separate issue that he needs to deal with separately. Um, An appellant had no knowledge of any telephone conversations, text message conversations, or anything between counsel. Um, subsequent to that um, conversation that was held on April 24th, um, I was retained by the appellant um, on April 25th or 26th, and a virtual was here, a hearing was held within 48 hours. Um, at that point, the trial court took testimony from appellant's former counsel, who you were not made aware would be attending. Um, 
the magistrate, who we were not made aware would be attending, and uh, appellee's counsel who's present here today. And remind me, did you object? I did. Yeah. Yes, I did. But there was objections. Yes, there okay. was. Um, I objected um, multiple times during that because first it was the, the and I'll come back to this later because that's one of my points. First, it was kind of like a casual conversation that was taking place and I recognized that now we're taking testimony, so I objected at that point. And then I asked for the magistrate or the judge to swear in everybody and have the opportunity to, um, to question him as well. Did you assign that as error on your appeal, the process that took place for this hearing? No, I didn't, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> um, subsequently, um, after the magistrate, all parties agreed that there had been um, a, a settlement agreement, the judge then recused herself and stated that she wanted to have another judge take a look at it or offered me the opportunity to have another judge do another hearing or take a look at it um, simply because her magistrate had just testified and, and, and that again, um, uh, we could have the appearance of impropriety. So I'll circle back to kind of the points I want to make about how that hearing was held, but uh, on to standard of review. Um, Clark versus Corn and Ray versus Wessel state that the standard for review in cases where um, a settlement agreement is in question is de novo when we're assert when a party is asserting that unreliable evidence was taken into account. Um, so let's talk about the settlement agreement and the requirements to obtain a settlement agreement. Um, the burden of establishing its existence lies with the party who's asserting it, and that would be the appellees in this case. Here, uh, the parties assert that an oral settlement agreement existed between the parties, um, and an oral settlement agreement can only be enforceable if there is sufficient particularity to form a binding contract. Um, at that hearing, we argued that there was no particularity because there was no kind of final meeting of the minds and nobody really knew, my client never even knew a settlement, uh, a subsequent settlement offer existed. Um, we know that a, a contract requires offer and acceptance, which is known as meeting of the minds and consideration. But was there an open offer? No, my client, per my client's recollection, and again, I wasn't there yet, uh, or at the, at the previous pretrial, was that the, off, the final offer made by the Pelley's was 10000 he declined, he made an offer for 15,000, they declined, and then they were instructed to proceed towards the trial. But at the hearing, didn't the magistrate and the two attorneys agree that in fact there was an open offer uh, and that was the nature of the agreement? Yes, that's, that's exactly what happened. So the magistrate indicated that she was going back and forth between the parties, that uh, Mr. Hicks and his client had made an open offer of 10,000 and my client's attorney indicated that he would consider it or bring it back to my client. Um, he, again, I know this is another separate whole ish area of the law, but my client indicates that he never had that discussion with his attorney. And your brief indicates that we should overturn the trial court decision in reverse because your client's former attorney is not credible. That's correct. But even if we find your, that that attorney is incredible, don't we still have the magistrate and the other attorney who say this is the agreement that that attorney said existed. Yes, and you know, and there's also, you know, the argument could be made that the magistrate was kind of running back and forth in between, and she and she previously indicated on the record that she wasn't really sure, but then she said at the end, then there was ten, that the, there was an open offer. Um, if you look at the record there, again, it was a kind of a casual conversation that was taking place at first. At first, she said she wasn't really sure, and then she stated, "Oh, there was an open offer at 10000 When you say casual conversation, you're referring to the hearing that occurred, right? To talk about the enforcement settlement hearing. Exactly. If you initially was a casual conversation, then you would recognize at some point, "Oh, wait a minute, we've now split people in." Exactly. Hearing. Exactly. This is a little bit odd. So. Exactly. So. And not the settlement process. I just make sure you were referring to the settlement process that allegedly occurred with the casual conversation. Exactly. And so, at the so let's circle back because that's a good transition to circle back into my argument that this that there's not credible this this witness isn't credible. My client's former counsel knew that he didn't have that authority to enter into that settlement agreement. Settlement agreement. I submitted documentation as exhibits to my amended objection to the settlement um, to the settlement uh, or objection to enforce the settlement agreement. I submitted documents that showed that my client's attorney knew that he did not have authority to make any final offers. And at the hearing to enforce the settlement agreement, I'm not going to call it that because that wasn't intended to be, but did 
did you talk about those emails? Did, did you ask attorney? About I that? didn't, and I'll tell you why. Because I didn't know that former counsel, I almost said his name, sorry, former counsel, I didn't know that he would even be there. Um, so I entered, um, just, just for the record, I entered my notice of appearance on the 26th. The hearing was held the very next day. Um, I was only thing I was contacted for was to, because there was some confusion as to whether that hearing would take place in person or virtually. Nobody indicated that he would even be there. And I'll just let you know you're down in about 45 seconds. Oh, okay. You, time. you can go further if you want to, but you'll it'll cut into it. Okay, understandable. So let's circle back to that. We had a, I'll, I'll wrap up my argument so I can get to, to rebuttal. But we had an, we had an incredible witness. He knew an uh, incredible witness. He knew that he didn't have the authority. So in order to save face, he got on the record and testified that, that there was an open offer. And he did that after everyone else said the same thing. He did not, he knew that there was an, an offer there. Him and my client had emails, discussions that there wasn't an offer there. And so um, had I known that he would have been there, I would have brought those emails and put them on the record and said, hey, you know that these, th you know that that wasn't the conversation. You didn't even tell your client you were having settlement negotiations. But I had no opportunity to do so because I wasn't even informed that he would be there. Counsel, could I just ask you a real, hopefully a quick question. Um, so former counsel did uh, agree and admit that there was a settlement or at least there was an open offer and so forth, and then was uh, accepted a settlement agreement. And your client is saying, well, he never had that authority. Why is this not just a malpractice or an ethics case? Well, there's a there's a malpractice case pending. So we, we filed that, to, and we're preserving our claim. And so this is- But what I'm saying is nobody is really disagreeing that the attorney agreed to a settlement agreement. My it's, clients, well, my client's belief is, in recollection is that there was no final offer to be made. Right, but what I'm saying is your client's main argument is that he did not have authority to make that offer. It is, Your Honor, and so my client has asked me to pursue all opportunities to get this cleared up, and so I'm here to advocate on his behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, indicated by appellant counsel, uh, this matter has been involved in the courts for a period now in excess of three years. Uh, I know that uh, a copy of the transcript has, has been provided as, as part of this proceeding, and we can, we can look back to that date uh, in, in April of last year when in the trial court, uh, a hearing was held in order to discern what the nature of the uh, what the nature of the settlement had been at an earlier date, there on April 13th, when uh, the parties and their counsel and uh, the trial judges, uh, magistrate, had engaged in in efforts at resolution over a period of just about four hours. Uh, I, I, I can indicate that uh, as consistent with the the, uh, the transcript and, and the statements of the various individuals in that transcript was our understanding that there had been an offer of uh, $10,000 which was uh, suggested a settlement of this and it had initially been payable over a period of two years and ultimately near the very end they, the, uh, the plaintiff uh, had indicated that they would, they would allow three years. We never uh, declined any offer, we never refused, we never opposed and ultimately it it evolves into an aspect of contract law where there is offer and acceptance. And that is what occurred when I, I believe on uh, April 24th, 2023, it was directly stated to uh, the plaintiff's counsel that uh, Mr. Freeberg would, would accept the offer of $10,000. 
this was done electronically, it was certainly something that was plainly documented, and it was not something that uh, was, was just, just verbal. As this court would be aware from the transcript, uh, further communications went on with regard to when the money could be paid, and uh, I, as counsel for the, uh, the defendant, indicated very, very soon. The money was thereafter, I believe, on uh, April 24th or April 25th. The full amount was paid into the clerk of court uh, in order to show uh, compliance and good faith. And at all times, we had, uh, we had believed that this immediate or near immediate resolution would have been favorably received as there would be no two or three year period of, of making payments. Did uh, appellant counsel indicate that the standard review here is de novo on what's on right and left? Do you agree that the correct standard review here? We would agree that there are circumstances where a de novo review is appropriate in a case, but it is our position that this never reaches that level because of the contractual nature of the negotiations within the trial court setting where there was offered ultimately acceptance and then as I indicate back with regard to the transcript uh, there is there is testimony from three officers of the court and it is clear that there was a ten thousand uh, dollar proposal, it was accepted, and it was ultimately paid. I don't believe that this has to rise to a level of, uh, of, of any de novo uh, ultimate review because of the nature of how it was concluded there within the trial court. It is the appellant's assertion that there was no time in the initial settlement discussion hearing when the parties were all present in front of the magistrate, is that correct? The parties would see each other over this time frame, maybe go to the restroom down the hall, but it's not unusual, of course, in mediation. And, and you know, to compliment your own court, we, we engaged in mediation through, through your services. And uh, it's not unusual for parties to be uh, placed in another room, in another area, and, and for the, the judicial official to, to engage in communicating and trying to bring the parties together. And, and I, don't, I don't agree that. I just want to make sure there is no opportunity for Mr. Vega to, at the settlement conference, be in front of the magistrate to say, I agree or I don't agree as to what we're talking about. It was all done through Mr. There is no question, based on my presence, that the, the court magistrate was going into the jury room and spending considerable time in there uh, with the former counsel with, uh, for, for the appellant and the appellant and then coming out and, and seeking uh, input from, uh, from the and, defendant. And, and at the settlement hearing that took place, we had the testimony of the two counsels and the magistrate who said this was the agreement. Was there any, any testimony that Mr. Vega, through counsel or otherwise, that the magistrate or yourself know that this agreement was no longer something he was willing to do? There was never at any time uh, any indication that the proposed agreement was rescinded, was off the table, was no longer viable. And well, none that was presented to you or the magistrate. He, as I understand, the hearing said, I told my attorney at some point in time I didn't want to go on with the agreement. That was never directed to you or the magistrate. Could you say that? 
could, could you could you express your question again? Uh, in reality, near the end of the four hour time frame, it was proposed that maybe three years would be uh, it was proposed that three years would be also soon, and that was not a three year payment period would be suitable and, and that was never that was never declined in any way either. So it, it shows the, the ongoing nature and the efforts of all of the parties in trying to uh, in trying to bring resolution. Uh, there's no question that my client and myself saw the plaintiff appellant and his counsel from where we were sitting across the street in the Summit County Courthouse get on the elevator uh, because we had spent much of the time outside of the trial. Uh, Your Honor, we would submit that the transcript and the statements of the officers of the court accurately convey the nature of the negotiations. There was no uh, as I say, there, there was no rejection. There was offer and acceptance and ultimately payment. Uh, the, the issue of credibility has been touched on here. The issues between the plaintiff appellant and, and his former counsel are, are often a different realm. We believe that uh, that the court should uphold the, the decision of the, the trial court and uh, confirm the, the position we have maintained. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Counsel, since you were your after time went to answer Judge Hart's question, I will give you the full five months for rebuttal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. And I don't think I need the whole five minutes, but I'll and I'll try to be brief. Um, I just wanted to touch on something that appellant's counsel stated that the settlement offer was plainly documented. Apparently, the tech there were text messages which discussed the offer and acceptance of the settlement agreement. I never saw them. The court never saw them. They're not on the record. So these things were not plainly documented. So the hearing that took place does one place on the record or. In filing respond to objections or anything like you had your emails on the response. Exactly. You didn't, there was no response saying, look, here's all these emails that tell us what they're doing. Exactly. Thank you. So it was an oral agreement that apparently took place at pretrial. And again, I also wanted to touch on the mediation process or the informal mediation process that took place during that pretrial. When we came to mediation here, our client, I was in a separate room with my client. Attorney Hicks was in a separate room with his client. We had a very long day of separate, and our mediator was going back and forth. But at the end, at the conclusion, we all sat in the same room, and we said, these are the things that happened. These are the things that we're discussing. I'm, I'm saying this. You're saying that. And here are the next steps. That's the exact same thing that probably should have taken place before that pretrial. Um, but this wasn't a formal mediation, like you said, right? That's, that's correct. Um, the trial court level, had, I mean. Right, but when we have a magistrate who's running back and forth between rooms and there's kind of like an open offer but we're really not sure what the terms are, probably would have been good for her to just have everybody come in and say what the next steps are. I've done that. We've done that in almost every piece of litigation that I've ever been involved in. But Attorney Hicks has been practicing much longer than me, so I'll defer to him, right? Um, and then finally, um, there was test, um, there was, Mr. Vega testified that he did not agree to the $10,000. I believe he did that on the record. Um, during that uh, virtual hearing that took place, that very informal virtual hearing. And then lastly, I did not attack the procedure as an error, as an assignment of error, but I did attack the procedure during my argument that Mr. Ve Mr. Or Mr. Vega's former, former counsel should not have been given any weight because his testimony was not credible. So in my argument, I didn't get to this point during uh, my main argument, but we, we, there, there should have been a second hearing. There should have just been a second hearing. The first hearing was very casual and informal. Objections were made. 
the, uh, the next judge had the opportunity to review that on the record, there should have just been a second hearing so we could get all of that cleared up and we would have the opportunity to address former counsel at that point. And I made it very clear that I, wouldn't, I wasn't aware that he was going to be there, so I should have been given an opportunity to impeach him or cross-examine him. And, and I don't recall, I let it briefly at your closed hearing brief you filed mm -hmm. in this case. I don't recall in that brief did you argue, hey, this procedure was faulty, we should have a new hearing? You know what? I don't recall if I did clearly. I know I stated that I didn't have an opportunity to address former counsel and that I would have been able to, you know, and, and that here are the things that would have impeached him if I had that opportunity. So I can't state whether or not I said explicitly, give me a new hearing, but I did, you know, uh, uh, and I was trying to be careful in attacking that procedure in that second, of, you know, in that second objection, I mean, the objection that I filed. So I hope that answers your questions. Thank you so much, Your Honors, for giving your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I want to thank you both today for your presentation. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. The clerk will to mail a copy of that decision to you. Um, when it comes out, it will also be available on the High Supreme Court website. Thank you. Thank you.